Well, it's Monday the 13th of September and you're more than welcome to this talk. Now, one of the things I want to talk about today is with this virus going endemic, an individual might be left with the choice as to whether they get infected or not if they want to maximize their self-protection because we know that the immunity wanes over time and we now know that protection against symptomatic disease severe disease and hospitalization is going to wean over time and of course governments are well aware of this and it looks like in the united states the third dose is, is coming and it looks like the prime minister in the uk will probably be announcing a third booster dose of the vaccine in autumn as well now if that's the case it's actually got quite a significant uh, import really because if, if I'm going to get exposed to the natural virus which I am because it's going to become endemic then personally from a per purely personal point of view I would think that I'm probably better to be exposed after I've had a third dose rather than after I've had the two doses I've had now this doesn't change government policy and of course we all have to follow government policy we have to do uh, what we're told um, and that is still to prevent in infection or uh, spread transmission of the disease but if I wasn't getting a third dose, then I might be tempted to think, well, I'm not getting a third dose. So maybe it's better to get infected now to boost my immunity naturally, to add the natural immunity on top of my vaccine induced immunity. And uh, that's going to optimize my chances of getting minimal disease and severe disease in the future. But again, if I was getting a third dose of vaccine, I might be tempted to think, well, I'll just wait and get exposed after I've had the third dose of the vaccine. So, as I say, this is just me thinking out loud, but uh, we have to follow government policy. But that's an interesting, uh, interesting collection of ideas. So let's look at what the governments are saying on that now, if we have the technology. I think we probably do. There we go. So th this is the uh, this is the MH uh, MHR Medicine and Healthcare Regulatory Authority statement on booster doses of the Pfizer and AstraZeneca COVID nineteen vaccines from the UK. And I'm pleased to say that the MHRA have now got their own logo, which <laughs> logos seem to be seem to be mandatory for everyone has a logo these days. I'll have to get one myself at some stage. Anyway, this is Dr. June Rain, the chief executive. We know that a person's immunity may decline over time after their first vaccine course. We know that. And the risk we now know that the risk of severe disease and hospitalisation is going to decline in time. So she says, I'm pleased to confirm that COVID-19 vaccines made by Pfizer and AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca, can be used as safe and effective booster doses. So this is the MHRA giving the booster dose, the, the, the green light, essentially. But now it will be for the Joint Committee on, on uh, Vaccination and Immunity. It would now be for the JVCI to, to advise on booster jabs will, if, they, if they will be given and, and when. So, it's, so basically they've said that, that the drug is OK, the medicines are OK to use. Now over to the people that just, uh, decide about the vaccines. But then, of course, um, it's going to go over to the government after that. So Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation will decide. Then the government will decide after that. Now, we believe in the UK, Boris Johnson is going to announce tomorrow that this is going to go ahead. Looks like it. Looks like it. So discussion where the booster doses for the elderly and vulnerable are needed could be the end of September. Final government's going, final decision in the UK is with the government. Now, Centres for Disease Control in the United States... Now, they, they, um, they've they got the logo, of course, but they also like their credit card uh, sizes of information. So this is monitoring incidents of COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations and deaths by vaccination status in the US. Now, th this is fairly brief. We could go into this in great detail, but we're not going to. Uh, this basically is saying that these are the uh, relative risks. So infection risk five times less for doubly vaccinated. Hospitalization risk was about 11.3% reduced risk, actually. 11.3 times rather, 10 times less likely to be, not 11 times less likely to be hospitalized. And uh, 10 times less likely to die if you are hospitalized. So these are pretty good uh, odds, really. So there is something to be said for these credit cards, these sort of infographics that give concise information. So that's good. So that kind of clarifies where we're at now. But of course, we know that this is waning. This is remarkably disappointing. I was really hopeful that the immunity from these vaccines would be reasonably long term, but it isn't. I think we can say that now. I'm disappointed with the longevity of the vaccine. Now, whether the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine turns out to have a longer lifespan, it may well. Uh, other vaccines like, like uh, the, the protein only vaccines that have come along may well but at the moment we've got what we've got and we've been vaccinated <laughs> what we've been vaccinated with so this is kind of where we are at at the moment 
Centers for Disease Control again commenting on this based on our latest assessment. The current projection, uh, the current protection against severe disease, hospitalisation and death could diminish in the months ahead. Well, I think it will diminish in the months ahead. I think that's now pretty well established, especially among those at higher risk or vaccinated during the earlier phases of the vaccine rollout. So basically they are saying here they're admitting that the, the immunity is wearing off. For that reason, we conclude a booster shot will be needed to maximise vaccine-induced protection and prolong its durability. So if I was in the United States now, I'd be thinking, well, I'm getting a booster dose. It's maybe eight months since my first dose. I'm getting a booster dose. I'll get the booster dose. Then that might be the best time to get natural infection. That might be the way some people are thinking, but obviously you'll have to follow government guidelines. Um, we are prepared to offer booster shots for all Americans beginning the week of the 20th of September, so pretty soon, starting eight months after the individual's second dose. So these are people that were vaccinated, basically the start of the vaccination programme where it can be wearing off now. We also anticipate that booster shots will be likely to be needed for people who receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Now, there's more data coming through on, on the uh, Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but here really for the first time they're saying, well, no, we are going to have to give boosters for that as well. Now, whether this is going to be a booster dose of the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine or whether it's going to be a booster dose of something else, I don't think we know yet, but we do have provisional data that shows a second dose of the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine does seem to give very high levels of protection. So if I'd had that first, I might be thinking I want that second as well, but we'll have to wait and see what they say on that. Now, I want to just finish today on a couple of things that we need to learn for future pandemics. Now, I've got quite a few things in mind. I'm actually working on quite a long list of people to talk to about what we learn from this pandemic for future pandemics. Because as I've said many times, this pandemic could have been a lot worse. The virus is transmissible now, but it could have been more transmissible for, from the future. But it could have been a much more pathogenic form of virus with a much higher infection fatality rate. So in some ways, we've been fortunate. And if we learn from that, this is good. This is one of the existential threats to humanity. Now, I've actually been teaching students that there's going to be another pandemic for about 30 years, but I did expect it to be influenza and not coronavirus. So the next one could be influenza, coronavirus, or some other virus that you and me have never heard of, because there's billions of them in the world to choose from. So we really need to learn from this. Now, just to give this example here, the Pandemic Institute has been formed in Liverpool. Um, so this is a new seven, seven authorities and institutions uh, with some external funding, 10 million pounds or dollars, I can't remember, external funding to be, uh, to be starting off with in uh, in Liverpool and I've lost my way of moving this. There we go. <laughs> um, so Pandemic Institute in Liverpool, seven authorities and institutions, including the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, where I actually studied myself for a period of time. A very, very fascinating uh, place to study. Uh, so the aim here is to prevent future pandemics, accelerate vaccine development, human challenge facilities. So what they're saying here is if at the start of this pandemic we've been able to give the virus to people, see how they do and work out how well the vaccines are protecting them, that would have saved months. Controversial I know, but they are starting a human challenge facility for human for people that are at low risk of severe complications of future viral infections. Um, high containment facility outside the hospital which will speed the process. And uh, we could have had uh, first wave trials if this had been available before. So we, we, in other words, we could have had a vaccine three, four months earlier than we did if this facility had been available. Uh, so uh, this professor at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, if, va if vaccine candidates could have been tested during the first wave of infections, uh, the jabs could have been ready months earlier. And of course, that's gonna, that would have saved a lot of lives. Here in Liverpool, I led one of the sites for phase three Oxford studies were able to set up really quickly. When the government implemented a national lockdown, the number of cases plummeted. And of course, that meant that the data took longer to come, paradoxically. We were, we were um, expecting to have the vaccine res study results in three months, and it took much longer because there was less community transmission. So, But if they'd been infecting people deliberately, that wouldn't have been a problem. That's, that's, this is the interesting change. Uh, they're also going to be building a database of diseases affecting animals, trying to work out which might be the most likely to jump the species barrier. So normally, of course, as we know, the virus stays in, in individual species. I don't get kennel cough and my dog doesn't get measles from me. Um, but the zoonotic spillover infections are what caused this pandemic. Uh, the circumstances under which that took place, we don't know, but we believe that's what caused this pandemic. 
So uh, building a database of diseases affecting animals, trying to work out which might be the most likely to jump the species barrier. So definite need here for collaboration with veterinary science. We need much more collaboration with veterinary science. I sometimes talk to vets and you can just chat to them as if you're talking to one of the consultant doctors at work. They, 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 it's just the same. The medicine is all the same. And, um, you know, we really need to synergize much, much more, I think, than we are doing with veterinary science. Uh, but there's a lot of animals to go through. There's 1,500 species of bat alone, and each of those 1,500 species of bat are infected by potentially hundreds of different viruses, which are specific to that species. So that's 1,500 species of bats, bats 10,000 species of something else, each with several hundred viruses that can regularly infect. You can see the size of the job here, but that's what they want to work on. Now, Professor Bayliss, Liverpool University, uh, what I hope is in 10 years time we're able to be much more precise as to which species need to be looking at and actually look at some of the species to confirm our predictions. So this is not overnight. So he's saying in 10 years time, we might be able to refine the search. This is how big this job is. We can refine the search hopefully in 10 years time. Uh, it appears to have these properties. It could be transmitted in this way. It could cause this type of disease. So, so what it's hoping to do here is look at the genetics of the virus. As soon as you've got the genome of a new virus, which can get quickly, from that genome, he wants to learn to predict what animals it will infect, how transmissible it's going to be, what body systems it's going to infect, how pathogenic it's going to be, what the death rate is going to be. He's hoping to be able to do all of those things basically at the click of a computer switch once this database is established. But we're a long way off that yet, but it's a laudable aim. Now, the WHO has opened the hub for, pandem pan for pandemic and epidemic intelligence in Berlin. So this is another one. French government's launched one. Um, international initiative focusing on zoonotic disease. The Rockefeller Foundation has launched one. Let's just hope these guys get their act together and, and start singing off the home, same hymn sheet. What we don't want is, what we don't want is um, competition. We want synergistic collaboration between all aspects of science, medical science, veterinary science, biochemistry, cytology, everything epidemiology, medicine, every, everything all working together because this is a real threat to potentially, and it's not being melodramatic to say billions of humans in the future. Professor Bayliss again intends to set up hubs in East, West and South Southern Africa to work with local researchers, which of course is good, Malawi for example, but of course this virus did start in China, didn't it? So let's hope there's um, massive Asian collaboration with this as well. I'll leave you to decide how likely that is to occur. And finally, let's learn something from Denmark. So Denmark had restrictions in very early, the 11th of March 2020, um, and it's just lifted it now. So this has gone on for what, over 500 days now. They were very early to have vaccine passports. Uh, they're now saying coronavirus is no longer a critical threat to society. They were the first European member to, de to de declare this. So basically they're saying this is pretty well over for us now. They've had high vaccination rates. They've had robust testing and sequencing. And in fact, to say the sequencing in Denmark is robust is not enough. They, they, they sequence all positive tests. This is the only country to have done this. So they've always been bang on top of all the latest variants. Uh, they're not claiming herd immunity, so people are going to carry on getting infected. It is still going to go into endemic phase. Uh, they're no longer going to require their vaccine uh, passports, which were required for a long period of time, which the UK government, for example, has just ditched and won't happen in the United States, I don't think. Sweden, likewise, about to lift nearly all of their restrictions as well. So um, there we are. Um, Another pandemic will come. It's just a case of uh, when, what virus. Maybe we have limit. Well, no, no, we have quite a bit of control over that. The way we interact with animals, we have to stop abusing uh, wild animals for food. We have to reduce the massive uh, animal based monocultures we have with many cloned animals in, in Western societies. Maybe we just have to start eating a lot less meat. We need to start making uh, marine zooplankton based foods, all sorts of things to change. But in terms of the pure science, so there's all those things to change in the way humans interact with the ecology of the planet. But in terms of pure science, how ready we are for the next pandemic depends on us. The technology is there. 
Are we going to choose to focus the resources so that next time a pandemic hits, we'll be there sorted within a few months as opposed to the... Um, well, you pick a word to describe what the reaction to be, has been to this pandemic. You might think of a word like, um, I don't know, organised, slick, streamlined. Maybe not, maybe not. Maybe chaotic, pathetic, retrospective, bit of a dog's breakfast. I'll let you choose. OK, that is us for today. Um, hopefully this trip is going to be over soon and we'll get back to our pop studio soon. So that would be great. So, OK, but thanks for watching this video.